What if you could find a cheesy 90s alternate history TV show right here on Earth, where anything is possible? Same cliches, different networks. I found that TV show. Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrovich, the alternate historian, and welcome to the first episode of my retrospective on Sliders, which I am calling Resliders. For those who don't know, Sliders was created by Bob Weiss and Tracy Torme, and it lasted from 1995 to 2000, with the first three seasons airing on Fox and the final two seasons airing on the Sci-Fi Channel. It was filmed in Vancouver for its first two seasons before production moved to Los Angeles. The idea for Sliders came after Torme read about George Washington nearly getting killed during the American Revolutionary War, causing him to imagine a history where he died early. Sliders was also produced by John Landis, who worked on films like Animal House and Blues Brothers, which are some of my favorite comedies, although Sliders is more of a serious show. Sliders follows a group of people called, well, Sliders, who travel between parallel timelines hoping to return home to their original Earth or Earth Prime. This gives Sliders a lot of similarities with Doorways, an unaired pilot created in 1992 by little-known fantasy author George R.R. R. Martin. In fact, there was a rumor that Torme stole the idea after he was turned down for a job on Doorways, but he denied this, and Martin clarified that it was Torme's agent who was trying to get Torme the job, not Torme himself. The original cast of Sliders consisted of Quinn Mallory, played by Jerry O'Connell, a physics student who lives with his widowed mother and is the inventor of sliding technology. Fun fact, in an interview, O'Connell said he originally auditioned for Party of Five and didn't want to audition for Sliders, preferring a more dramatic show, but decided to go with Sliders so he could work with Weiss and Landis. Then there is Professor Maximilian Arturo, played by Royal Shakespeare alum John Rhys Davies, who also played Sala from Indiana Jones and Gimli from Lord of the Rings. He plays Quinn's mentor and, in my opinion, gave the show a huge level of gravitas. Also, he and O'Connell became close friends while filming and he would take O'Connell flying and clubbing, which is neat. Next is Wade Wells, played by Sabrina Lloyd. She is Quinn's friend and will-they-won't-they they love interest. I personally liked her upbeat, optimistic personality, which paired well with some of the more serious characters. While filming Slider, she and O'Connell briefly lived together, but it was completely platonic per O'Connell. Finally, there is Rembrandt Brown, played by Cleveland Derricks, a professional singer who accidentally became a Slider. Honestly, he is my least favorite member of the original cast. I didn't like his whiny comic relief personality, but I heard he became a more well-developed character in later seasons. And considering he was the only character of the original cast who made it to the last season, I hope he'll get some character development. Yeah, Sliders was a show that had a lot of behind-the-scenes drama. While it had a great concept and some real talent working on it, Sliders suffered from poor writing, budget constraints, network interference, and disputes between cast members. This led to a decline in quality, which became so bad that most of the original cast left before the last season, and even O'Connell admits to not watching a single episode of season 5. So why bother with Sliders? What's the point of rewatching a two decades old show that failed? Well, Sliders was an ambitious attempt to bring alternate history to the small screen. And for the longest time, it was the example the media used when talking about our favorite genre. Plus, Sliders continues to have a dedicated fan base, and there have been calls to reboot the series. In fact, one could argue we wouldn't have our current golden age of alternate history television without it. On a personal note, while I credit Harry Turtledove's World War and the Bounds for getting me into alternate history, I remember watching the first couple of seasons of Sliders and enjoying them. I'm not sure why I stopped, but Sliders deserves some credit in turning me into the assessed geek I am today, and that is why I think it deserves a second look. But before we enter the gateway, I want to cover two things. First, I'm going to be watching the episodes in the order they were attended, because the networks tended to air them out of order, and I want to give the story the best chance it can to impress me. Second... There's going to be spoilers, so you've been warned. We begin with the pilot movie, simply titled Sliders. In a San Francisco basement, Quinn tapes a diary entry documenting his latest efforts to perfect an anti-gravity device, which has instead opened some type of gateway. Afterward, he drives to school where a radio announcer talks about having topless feminists on the air. How desperate were people in the 90s for nudity that they would tune into a radio station just to hear it described to them? Quinn attends a Toro's physics class, where Davey shows us just how much class he brings to Sliders, before Quinn proceeds to his job at a computer store, where he talks briefly with Wade, completely oblivious to her obvious interest in him. Back home, Quinn tries to find out where the gateway leads to. Using a timer he invented, he decides to travel through it himself. How did Quinn afford all this equipment? I mean, he's a student who works a minimum wage job. I mean, maybe his family's independently wealthy, but I don't think you can build a wormhole generator just with stuff you order from Radio Shack and put together in your spare time. Anywho, on September 27th, 1994, after setting the timer for 15 minutes, Quinn steps through the gateway, and my god, this 90s era CGI look awful. Quinn exits back into his basement, and thinking he failed, drives to class and almost crashes after running a green light. 
He turns on the radio and learns about global cooling, vinyl beating CDs, and Americans crossing illegally into Mexico. Plus, JFK is still alive and is still president, but he is instead married to Marilyn Monroe. Quinn even sees a billboard advertising Elvis' upcoming concert in Las Vegas. Returning home, Quinn finds his mother married to the gardener and pregnant. Then the timer hits zero and Quinn leaves Elvis Earth behind for Earth Prime. Plausibility-wise, Elvis Earth is just silly. I mean, it was probably designed just to showcase the most obvious differences possible for the audience, so because of that, I'm just not going to say too much about it. When Quinn later attends Arturo's class to tell him what happened, Arturo angrily dismissed the class and berates Quinn for mocking his theories. Confused, Quinn goes to his job, but he finds he got himself fired and also kissed Wade. When Quinn returns home, he runs into a Quinn from an alternate timeline who was responsible for what happened while Quinn was gone, and, in a scene I'm sure Rick and Morty borrowed from, perfects the sliding technology for him. Also, Alt Quinn is a douche. I mean, he mentions he's married and yet he kissed Wade. I mean, maybe he's married to Alt Wade in his timeline, but we don't know that. I just think Quinn should have called out Alt Quinn a little bit more for being such a jerk to his friends. Alt Quinn explains that he's been sliding between timelines for months, and he even found a timeline where the Cubs won a World Series, which is a joke that hasn't aged well. He also explains sliding is random, but with the timer he can control how long he stays. Alt Quinn tries to warn Quinn about something, but before he can, his gateway sucks him back to his timeline. Arturo and Wade arrive at Quinn's house, where Quinn shows him the gateway. As Quinn draws more electricity from the house to widen the gateway for them to travel through, he accidentally envelops a car driven by Rembrandt, who is on his way to sing the national anthem at the San Francisco Giants game. Fun fact, in our timeline, the 1994 baseball season was canceled on August 11th because of a player strike. This means there wouldn't have been a Giants game for Rembrandt to sing at. So does this mean Earth Prime isn't our timeline, or is this just a poor piece of writing? You decide. Arturo, Quinn, and Wade arrive in a frozen basement with a timer set for five hours. They proceed upstairs and find everything iced over, a la the day after tomorrow. And yet, despite the code, you never do see their breath. While exploring the house, Quinn finds a picture showing he has a sister and a dog in this timeline. Emerging from the house, the three meet Rembrandt, and they speculate about what happened to Tundra Earth. But then a tornado appears, and they have to open another gateway to survive, even though the timer hasn't hit zero yet. The gateway opens, and they slide into a new timeline. They arrive in what appears to be Golden Gate Park. Rembrandt hails a taxi to take him to the game, but is arrested after he attempts to give the driver a dollar bill to pay for tolls, because in this timeline, dollars are red and have a picture of Nikita Khrushchev, not Washington. This is because our heroes are now on the dystopia known as Soviet Earth. Wade attempts to call home, but the People's Telephone and Telegraph, or PTNT, tries to trace her call, and Arturo and Quinn see the statue of Lincoln in the parks is now a statue of Lenin. Arturo and Quinn and Wade learn from the West Coast branch of the American underground resistance that America lost the Korean War, and gradually the Sino-Soviet Empire conquered the world, isolating America from the global economy before invading them. It's not clear when America was invaded by the Soviets. We're told Rembrandt's double was killed during the Detroit Uprising in 1982, and since the show implies the uprising was against the Soviets, that puts the day of the invasion in the 1970s or very early 80s, at the latest. Still, I'm not sold on how plausible this timeline is. I can understand how America's fortunes would be worse if they utterly lost the Korean War, and how effective the communist bloc would be if the Sino-Soviet split didn't happen. But why invade America? Even with a friendless America at this point, America would still have nukes, which would make any invasion costly. But who knows? Maybe the writers just watched too much Red Dawn. Back to the show. Our trio see Rembrandt sentenced by Judge Wapner of the People's Court, who was the star of our timelines, the People's Court, from 1981 to 1993, to 15 years in an Alaskan gulag. With the Underground's help, who have come to accept the fact that they are travelers from another timeline, the Sliders raid the prison to liberate Rembrandt and Wade's double, a resistance commander. Posing as his own double, the Citizen General of West Coast Operations, Arturo, the Sliders, and the Underground escape with Rembrandt and Alt Wade, the later who was killed during the escape, leading to Quinn being emotionally devastated until he realizes his Wade is still alive. Meanwhile, Arturo and Quinn repair the timer and return to Golden Gate Park after saying their goodbyes to the underground. They think the raid will inspire others to rise up, but considering that the entire world is under the Soviet's boot, their leader is dead, and they now have to abandon their secret base, the Resistance won't be raising the Star Spangled Banner over Moscow anytime soon. There is a nice scene though when we get to see Rembrandt sing Amazing Grace over the bodies of dead Resistance fighters, which was actually pretty moving and makes me wish the pilot used a character more like this rather than for cheap jokes. 
Trying to flee Soviet Earth, the Sliders are pursued by a mob of Soviet agents and barely escape through the gateway. Thinking they are back on Earth Prime, Quinn arrives with the others at his house, but their talk about what to do with the timer is interrupted by Quinn's father, who died on Earth Prime, thus showing that the Sliders' journey home is far from over. You know what? This was a pretty good pilot. Sure, it has its flaws. The alternate timelines visited are either lazy or implausible, and some of the characters can be annoying, but it's still a strong episode to start with. The interactions between the main cast help drive the story along, and you really want to see them make it home. I did read a review by Seamus Kelly of Den Geek, who dismissed the episode as just another overthrow the government story that would become a staple of sliders, but you can't really judge the first instance of a cliche too harshly. Plus, the fall of the Soviet Union in our timeline happened only a few years before the premiere of the pilot, so seeing Soviet Earth must have struck a chord with the adult audience, and, if IMDb is to be believed, Sliders was the highest rated premiere of 95. So will the next episode of Sliders hold up to the pilot? Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Until then, if you like what I do, please comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrich, the Alternate Historian. Bye!